Maestro, April 13 and 14, Elgar and Beethoven. If there's a more beautiful cello concerto, save Dvorak, I don't know what it is because Elgar is, is just, between his violin concerto and his cello concerto, they're some of my favorite music on earth. And the violin concerto is rarely played. I mean, it has a renaissance now, but it's rarely played. The cello concerto, of course, you know, part of the, you know, one of the most important uh, pieces in the repertoire. Interesting with the cello concerto for me, when I, when I first performed it, I, um, I was just conducting Tristan uh, at the time, and, uh, and I paired it with Tristan. It, it did it in the same week when I did Tristan. Um, and, um, you know, the whole piece is basically a Liebestod. It's the whole piece is based on the, uh, on, on the Tristan chord, and on, the, on that motive that, that starts off Tristan, it's very, very interesting. And, you know, you see Elga here as a pure Wagnerian. Now, what's even more interesting is when the piece is written this in the aftermath of World War I. It's really, it's it really like, for me, it's, it's a, almost like a requiem uh, to the victims of World War I. Um, <clears throat> and this Liebestod um, going in there, and that a, an English composer would actually get close to one of the most important German composers, Wagner, it's actually also a, a sign of, um, of peace, you know, um, um, and crossing the bridge and that culture actually... And a reconciliation. Reconciliation in a certain way. Um, I, I, and I don't, I don't think it was seen at the time that way, but to me it is. And, and therefore I think um, it really bonds f extremely well with with Beethoven 9, which is all about brotherhood, all about the inclusion, all about brotherhood and, and being one and coming together. So I think this is actually, I, I, it, it was a coincidence that we had Johannes Moser and I wanted to change to Beethoven 9 to celebrate in a way the, the, the new San Antonio Symphony and after our turmoil. Um, I would have never come up with the idea of programming um, the Elga Cello Concerto on Beethoven 9, but now actually I, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a stroke of genius um, that these pieces are on one program together and they really, the meaning of Beethoven 9 becomes more important through the Cello Concerto, I think, in the beginning. Yeah. Elgar's music always seems so longing. You're reaching out for some harmonious ending. He gives it to you. But it's just such lush romanticism, yeah. a la Wagner, lush romanticism without. Well, he does have motifs in, in de definitely. He also has and, this this and theme development, and the, well, and the ability of creating endless melodies, especially in the symphonies. You hear it in in the first symphony, also in the second, where you know where one intertwines with the other and then continues this 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 lack of cadence. Uh, that's, of course, very Wagnerian, and, and, and Elga knows very well how to place a cadence, especially in pomp and circumstance marches, but, but in, his, in his symphonic writing, he really um, elaborates it in a, in a fantastic and beautiful, beautiful way, and, and the cello concerto, I think, is the masterpiece of that. But thankfully, there's this interregnum from Brahms to Elgar, who let loose with his symphonies, that are just lush and full of wonderful melodies, but we're going to get to hear the cream, which is the yeah. cello concerto and the uh, and the wonderful Beethoven nine and um, Beethoven nine yeah. and the master singers and the master singers. And I, I I always I conduct the Beethoven nine a lot, um, but the the thing that for me is the most um, the deepest experience with Beethoven nine was a production that I did with Maurice Bejar. Um, in 1996 in Paris and then we toured it later to Japan um, and that was a choreography of Beethoven 9 which was truly amazing and the interesting thing what he did was he started it off but with an African drummer who was wheeled in on stage and he sat on his drums and then one of actually France's most interesting actors came on stage and cited from a poem by Nietzsche which talks about the idea of doing Beethoven 9 with dance. And then, it then, then the whole piece starts in the, you know, the first movement with the two couples 
um, on each corner of the, of the stage. And then, um, of course, the, the scherzo was a wall-like uh, um, um, movement. And then, of course, the slow movement, the most amazing pas de deux you, you can imagine, a real love song. <laughs> but the most interesting thing then was the fourth movement. He brought all the themes back, as before, you know, as Beethoven does, and all the dances back. And then in the middle of the combination of it, he brought in an African girl who completely improvised African dance in the middle of that. Everything else was really classical um, dancing, and, and she came in the middle. And at the end, the corps de ballet of 200 dancers came in, which was very multicultural, very multicultural, and was dancing the final scene on, on, the, on, the, on the final course of, of Beethoven 9. An amazing event, and really making it visual what Beethoven was about and, 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 and his. And when we did it in Japan, of course, it was even more spectacular, you know, with the, with, with the Japanese chorus, the, the French dance group, and it was just as. And that's what Beethoven 9 is really about. I think you can send it somewhere to Papua, Papua New Guinea, <laughs> they will relate to this music instantly. Because there's something in Beethoven um, that really speaks to the roots of... Um, and I said it in our last meeting when we talked about the Eroica and the combination of Duke Ellington. Well, that Beethoven has African blood. And you can feel it in his music. He is very rooted um, to where we all come from. Mm -hmm. And Beethoven 9 is a big statement of that. Noam, when <laughs> did you experience Beethoven 9 for the first time? Um, actually, that was when I was doing my master's at Illinois State University. We uh, performed Beethoven 9. I was singing in the chorus. Uh -huh. And uh, it was a very powerful experience. Uh, I think especially since um, I, I came from a different country. So I think, in a way, I felt that I could relate to the sense of bonding together, mm -hmm. even as feeling uh, uh, as a foreigner, as someone who's coming from the outside to another country. Is it performed in Israel as much as it is elsewhere? For example, in, in Tokyo, in the month of December, you can hear Beethoven 9 with 10 different orchestras, and it's performed like every single day. At least one orchestra is performing Beethoven 9. How is it in, in Israel? Is Beethoven 9 as popular as...? It's, it's popular, I think, as any other Beethoven symphony. In yeah. Israel, we love Beethoven, you know. Yeah. And first of all, it, I, I think that uh, his temperament fits us very well. Oh yeah, <laughs> he know? had to move 52 <laughs> times in Vienna <laughs> because he, uh, he was a very temperamental person. Um, yeah, and it didn't get any better when he lost his hearing. You know. Sure. Yeah, but you know, we we just uh, we like to express ourselves and uh, and we are yeah. not afraid of confrontation. I think it's very uh, better in in a way. Yeah. Very outspoken. Outspoken. And standing for your ideals. I think that's also another Beethoven. Uh, statement. Here we are. Well, April 13, 14, we get to experience it up close and personal. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Maestro. Thank you. Thank you, Noam. Thank you.